I write, primarily I write young adult fantasy. I don't know if I could consider this young adult in this case, though it's kind of violent. And so this is kind of an offshoot from the novel that I'm currently working on. And so just what you guys need to know is that there's a city, Matka. Matka is a city of evil wizards, and it's been tormenting the, the neighboring villages for, I would say, decades to centuries, and what has happened is that all the villages have, well, they've just had enough, and they've united, and they've just overthrown and destroyed the, um, destroyed the city of Matka. Um, a baby that was born in Matka has been smuggled out, and they found out, and they're really, they just want vengeance, and so the woodsman, has been hunting them, and so he's hunted this baby uh, to the beach, and once he gets to the beach, a ship is already sailing, and so he's lost his chance. And that's where the story takes off. Let me make sure there are any other details that you need to know. Nope, that's good, okay. <laughs> the woodsman who led the hunting party collapsed on the shore as the ship with the last survivor of Matka sailed beyond his reach. He prayed for the vessel to sink, but it floated safely beyond the horizon. He so badly wanted that baby dead. He got back onto his horse and raced back to Matka, without waiting for the others so he could find other survivors whom he could kill. Not long ago, one of Matka's stray hellhounds turned his son into a pile of mushy flesh and broken bone. That was how the woodsman found him, and try as he might not to, that was how he most often remembered him as well. He dismissed it as an accident. And, though he could continue, and thought he could continue with his life as normal. But he never got used to not hearing his son talking to imaginary friends while he gathered lumber. Weeks after the death of his son, the woodsman returned home and found his wife dead on their bed. Unnatural red and swamp green vines were strapping her body down, and around the thorns that were hooked into her skin were tail marks from the jostling of the rape. When the woodsman got back to Mathka from the beach, the city was already close to rubble. He rode through it anyway. He looked under fallen roofs, caved in cellars, and other piles of destruction for any survivors to wreak his, to wreak his help, vengeance on. But there were none. That baby was the last. He took out his axe and swung it against the earth in frustration. He hacked and hacked the ground that had supported this evil city. There were dead wizards all around him. The villagers could not decide what to do with the bodies. Was it better to bury them or burn them? What fate was the furthest from what the wizards would have wanted? In the end, they let them lie where they had fallen, with their faces turned down or mutilated beyond recognition. Everyone was attacking the earth beside the woodsmen. When their tools became useless, they scavenged through the rubble for anything that could hurt the brittle ground. Piece by piece, they dug deeper into the land till the woodsman struck the corner of something metal with his axe. When they had dug around it, they discovered a wizard's hidden vault. They were too angry to be suspicious when the heavy iron door swung open on its own. Inside were all manner of strange-looking talismans that promised power. The largest contraption was in the center, with a spellbook on top of it. It was three life-sized iron bars that met at the center above a pale gray spiral dish. The iron bars were hollow, and there were holes on either side of them. The exterior open points were molded into downward spikes. The spellbook constructed them that with three participants, the instrument would create a spirit of vengeance that would do their bidding. The woodsman immediately chose to be one of them. The other two were volunteered by the village that was closest to the shore, and was thus held accountable for letting the Matka baby escape. One was a 17-year-old orphan girl. She became an orphan when she was 12, when her folks were sent to Mufka with a peace offering and never returned. Her village demanded that she take part in her search award to honor her parents. The other was an older woman, a wife of one of the village heads. Ironically, the son they had had died of natural causes, but her husband had been blaming their son's death on Mufka and her negligence for years. The three of them laid down under the iron bars, with their feet by the center of the contraption and their necks beneath the curved spikes. The villagers crowded into the vault and chanted the spell from the book as the hollow spikes penetrated the soft tissues above the trio sternums. The machine sucked bile, 
clear fluid, and blood through their necks, and leaked it into the central dish where it spiraled together. It formed a stinking gelatinous mass that grew steadily as the ritual continued. At the end of the ceremony, the last of the fluid trailed off the machine and floated into the air above the three participants. It looked marginally human, though still a disembodied block of swollen fluids. Your command, the villagers heard, but they were not sure if the voice had come from the creature of their own heads. Kill the Mafka baby, they all said in unison. The mass of fluid billed out of the vault and towards the shore. They never saw it again. The 17-year-old girl was the first of the three to stand up. The effort had exhausted her. She would get some of her strength back, but not much, and would remain weak and vulnerable to disease for the rest of her life. She could not even help the older woman up, though she wanted to. The older woman had her strength, but exerting it was extremely painful. Her mobility would also be difficult for her after this. The woodsman, whose body was fit as a fiddle from daily woodcutting, would forever have trouble thinking. He only stood up when the girl urged him to, though he did, aw though he did awkwardly help the older woman to stand without being asked. He carried her in the same awkward manner to her house, and the girl, with no place else to go, followed. When the woodsman put the old woman down in the chair, he did not know what to do next, so the old woman directed him to a sack and told him to go out and get some food. The girl crouched in a corner. The two women did not say anything to each other until the woodsman came back late at night, with a full sack of vegetables in one hand and a dead boar swung over his other shoulder. The old woman told herself that she would have to be more, spe more specific with her instructions for him in the future. He swung the sack of vegetables as if it was his axe onto the table and almost broke it. Potatoes, onions, and turnips rolled onto the floor towards the corner where the girl was still huddled. She picked them up and took them to the kitchen to silently prepare a stew for the three of them. She heard a crashing sound that frightened her, and a minute later, the woodsman came into the kitchen and handed her a dripping leg of the boar. She had him cut it up into small pieces, which he did mostly with his axe, and used the meat for the stew. A day later, the old woman's husband came back. When he walked in, he saw his wife unable to move on the couch, the girl gazing out the window, and the British woodsman sitting by a dead boar that had bled out onto the floor. He left immediately and never returned. The old woman assumed that he had found some other evil talisman from the vault, like many others, and was using it to live a new life. She was happy that he was gone. The woodsman had a harsh exterior, but never yelled at her like her husband did. She was learning how to talk to him as well, and he listened to her, as did the girl, who did not go outside, and thus spent her time tending to their home. Outside of their house, things were always getting worse. Aside from the vengeance machine, the vault had been emptied of talismans, and the people using them were creating evil all around them. But the woodsman, old woman, and the girl were self-sufficient, and they made the part from it. They lived simple, apathetic lives until the day they died. Thank you.